Well, it's early spring. No leaves on the trees yet. Are you open? But of course, it lets the sun light through. And remind you how good it is to be free, to walk around. Unlike some parts of the world at the moment, where there's terrible atrocities taking place. Certainly uh, far different from this, the peace and the quiet. Sunshine, blue sky, birds tweetering in the trees. And yet in other parts of the world, there's bombs and missiles dropping, buildings being obliterated, people being obliterated, serious injuries, innocent children being hit. It makes me also remember the freedom that we have on some of the airwaves. And I thought at the end of this walk, I'm going to go back into the studio and talk about some of the freedom that we have uh, some of the things that in radio communications we must appreciate and use as much as possible and not take for granted. So, <laughs> that's what I'm going to do at the end of this walk. Quite a few text messages from uh, people that watch these videos and occasionally there's something really interesting that crops up and this is just such an occasion. It must have been about uh, nearly 18 months ago that I did a spy video about the Krogers, the Russian spies that lived in a bungalow in Ryslip in Middlesex. Um, they actually um, lived in this bungalow and were using it as a base to send messages back to Russia uh, using shortwave radio. <clears throat> and uh, this all happened in the 1960s and they were eventually found out. Um, MI5 tracked them down and they and other people involved in this spy ring were put in prison and ultimately there was an exchange of prisoners as it seemed to happen in those days. But I got some additional information from one of the uh, watchers of this video and I'm going to read it to you because I think it's, it's interesting reading. And I, I would encourage you to watch the video. I'll put a link below this video. Watch the original video, the original story, because it's quite fascinating, particularly if you're interested in radio. And then listen to what um, the viewer that uh, to this channel sent me a few days ago and it's additional information and then we'll go on from there. One of the central characters in this spy ring was Gordon Lonsdale, a Russian whose real name was Molody, M-O-L-O-D-Y and he was shadowed by MI5 over a period of several weeks and finally MI5's attention was drawn to 45 Cranley Drive, Ryslip. Interestingly enough that building or that bungalow is still there if you take a look on Google Earth. The bungalow was occupied by Mr and Mrs Kroger who were actually Russians and that wasn't their real surname but the husband posed as an antiquarian book collector. Now I'm told that a high speed tape recording was sent to Russia which would only take a few seconds but that doesn't quite stack up with what I have previously been informed and that is that Helen Kroger was a qualified radio officer and had a cipher machine so uh, whatever means was used it was sent at high speed but uh, it clearly wasn't normal audio recordings. The frequencies of the transmission back to Russia are unknown although it's claimed that local ham radio operators and uh, even RAF Northolt uh, were suffering from interference. The Kroger's transmitter was finally located underneath the trapdoor in the kitchen 
and subsequent owners of the bungalow reported finding various items of radio equipment buried in the garden. I often wonder whether these subsequent occupiers actually knew the history of this bungalow before they purchased it or occupied it. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting how this information comes about and it was a fascinating story. But you know, in recent times, like the last few weeks, we've had the invasion of Russia invading Ukraine and all the atrocities that have gone there. And it does sort of remind us, reminds me anyway, how fragile our communication system is. Now, we as ham radio operators, of course, are, it's our hobby communicating, but a lot of our radio communication systems are very fragile. For example, if the repeater goes down, then we lose the use of that repeater. So our VHF range is dramatically reduced. Likewise, our mobile telephone system. And then we've got our satellite system. Our satellite communication system, again, it could be closed down, it could be shot down. GPS, again, vulnerable. It's quite a compl complex system now, and I do believe that uh, it would be very difficult to um, uh, shut it down completely. But nevertheless, it is vulnerable. All these systems are vulnerable. And yet, if we go back to 1960s, when the Krogers, the Russian spies, were active, they didn't have a problem like that because their communication was on the HF bands, the shortwave bands. And it really does remind me that, you know, there's one radio system that can't be shut down. It can't be damaged. It can't be shot down. It can't be obliterated. It is our HF shortwave radio bands that played an incredibly important part in the Second World War. And, of course, it helped the Krogers, the Russian spies, to send their information back to Russia. The shortwave bands, it's a natural form of communication. Our signals are bounced back to Earth at some distant point because of the reflective layers in the shortwave system. And it's very, very effective. I mean, you can, you can set up your transceiver on your desk, your 100 watt transceiver on your desk. And if you want to talk to Moscow, not that you probably want to at the moment, but if you wanted to talk to somewhere in Eastern Europe, you can do it quite easily. You may have to change frequencies occasionally as radio conditions change, but you can do it. And the only way to stop that communication, apart from a radio blackout with a sudden solar storm, the only way you can stop that is by jamming it. And if it's jammed, you just move a little bit on your back in communication again. It's, it's one of nature's natural communication systems that doesn't rely on technology, provided you can generate the signal, provided you've got a receiver at the far end. You can make communication. Now, we know that during the Second World War, it played a very important part, the shortwave bands. It was one of the major ways of communication, even by, even by air. A lot of the time, it was aircraft that were sending signals back. Morse code was very much the fore then. Uh, all radio operators could send and receive Morse code. Very simple, basic system. Again, it doesn't need high tech. If you can generate a signal and switch it on and off, you're there. You can communicate with with stations in wherever you like, in, in Europe, in Africa, in America, just by switching your radio on and off. And in fact, interesting enough, Morse code really was the first form of data communication. And although the shortwave bands are very vulnerable to changing conditions, they rarely shut down. You just need to be able to move to the right point in order to re-establish communication. I think that the shortwave radio frequencies have started to demonstrate that they are not a forgotten part of our communication system. They are not nearly as vulnerable as some of the more sophisticated systems. In times of war and conflict, the shortwave bands can provide very valuable long-range, medium-range 
communication. And we as ham radio operators actually occupy quite a large portion, portion of the shortwave band. I think I did a calculation some while ago. We, we occupy something like about 7 or 8% of the shortwave spectrum, which is quite a large chunk for a bunch of amateurs. And of course, amateur radio is there when other systems have shut down. And it's in all sorts of odd places, it's in people's houses. It's not in buildings known to be housing radio communication systems that might be vulnerable. And radio operators can operate from their houses. They can op operate from a farmyard. They can operate from their car. So shortwave communication still has a lot to offer. But what about the vulnerability? What about the security? Yeah, the security. It means that everybody could listen to what's going on. You know, there's some clever things done during the Second World War. Even broadcast stations were able to provide information, significant information. It was, it was not a code. It was, it was an agreed signal between two parties that would happen if something else happened. I mean, I, I, I don't know the details, but I can imagine um, the weather forecast. If the weather, if the weather forecaster said that it's going to be unseasonably warm, it might have meant something to those who were designed to receive that message. Now, it's a code, but you can't crack it because you don't know what it means unless you've been primed. So it's very easy to, set, to, to send coded signals, but more, more sort of complex, immediate coded signals can be, can be um, generated in this day and age. And of course, we've also now got the technology to send signals that can be received in, even under very difficult conditions, weak signals. We've proved as amateurs that when the, when the bands are supposed to be dead, they're not actually dead. You can send FT8 over quite long distances when the band appears to be dead. Again, that technology can be used for military purposes. <laughs> now, I have been, I've been rambling on a few minutes about things which I think about, and I'm no expert on military communication, gosh, um, my heyday was when Morse code was Morse code, and it was one of the prime methods of sending signals. In fact, you couldn't get a ham radio a ticket an issue, could send and receive 12 words a minute. And only a few years before I was licensed, it was compulsory to be operate Morse code for, I think, one year or two years, can't remember now. But the shortwave bands are very valuable. And I think that sometimes we, we forget that that the shortwave bands offer one of the most natural forms of radio communication. I refer to the shortwave bands as nature's form of radio communication because it is down to nature that we can send signals over great distances. And finally, let's not forget the importance of the shortwave broadcast stations because the shortwave broadcast stations are one of the most effective mediums of getting information around the world even when countries like Russia are trying to suppress the truth. The shortwave broadcast stations are doing an incredible service, particularly in difficult times. And it is very difficult to jam all the shortwave broadcast stations. The BBC still run a, uh, an excellent service and they've been famous uh, many year, for many years now, their world service. But the broadcast stations do fulfill an important task. And the only problem is, of course, that there's less and less people with shortwave receivers these days. I mean, we do the Texan range of shortwave receivers and we sell them regularly. But I just wonder how many people now have got a shortwave broadcast receiver in their home compared with what they might have had 20 or 30 years ago. You know, the days when the old Valve radio sat on the sideboard or wherever it was in the, in the lounge or the living room or even the kitchen. And you had a shortwave band on it and you could twiddle around and listen to some of these fascinating transmissions. Well, I don't think so many people have got that now. I'm not sure what the answer is. But nevertheless, it is the most effective way 
of getting information around the world and it is very, very difficult to stop it. Yeah, by the way, you've got a, we haven't got a new studio, but this is a different layout now. I had to completely clear the studio out because we wanted a new carpet because before I had a hard floor and whilst it didn't really affect these sort of videos, if we were doing any um, live music in the studio, uh, it was a bit of a problem. So I had to unplug everything, lay down the new carpet, connect everything up and when I connected everything up, I decided I should have it a different sort of layout and of course, surprise, surprise, so certain things didn't work but I think most things are working now. <laughs> anyway, thanks for watching this video. Now, by the way, um, I'm off to Scotland um, uh, in a day or so's time, uh, to the west coast of Scotland. It's a long trip, it's about 550 miles, so it's about 10 or 11 hours drive there and back. So you may not see another video for about a week or so. Um, if I get a chance of doing any video in while I'm in Scotland, um, I will do so, but it's very much a flying visit um, and uh, I, I think I should be travelling more than I shall be um, stationary. <laughs> but I shall be back. Anyway, take care. Thank you for supporting this channel and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.